Well, there you have another episode of Straight Out of Combat Radio, audio medicine by Green Zone Hero. Today's guest has been on here before. It's been almost a year. He was our first Australian, and as a matter of fact, our only Australia infantryman to be on our show. Scott Jacko Jackman, who has created an organization in Australia called Whiskey's Wish. His mission is a valuable one to the lives of hundreds of people, uh, helping them, not just veterans, but also first responders, emergency management personnel, corrections officers, to help overcome the challenges of post-traumatic stress and other service-related emotional and physical injuries. Uh, so privileged and honored to have Jacko here again on the show, and I really appreciate you listeners sticking with us here on Straight Out of Combat Radio. You're going to enjoy this one. Thank you. Your steely-eyed killer shadow in the night. You were born to fight. You got to light them up. My name is John Krotek, and I want to welcome you to Straight Out of Combat Radio, audio medicine by Green Zone Hero. We're here to honor the wisdom of America's most valuable asset for combat veterans. We're authentic, we're empowering, we're American. Save us all before they burn it down. Our guest for this episode of Straight Out of Combat Radio has been here before. It has been almost a whole year since we've had Scott Jacko Jackman from the 8th 9th Royal Australian Regiment, ARA, you know, on our program. And I want everybody to know that he he's doing some amazing things. Before we get to that, his show was the second most listened to podcast show on Straight Out of Combat. So kudos to him. People love the story of Whiskey's Wish. We're going to get more into that today. But let me tell you a little bit about Jacko before we get started here. He is a or well, actually, he was deployed to both East Timor and Afghanistan. And in 2012, he sustained an injury. In 2013, he was diagnosed with major depression, post-traumatic stress, and a debilitating back and neck injury that basically got him medically discharged from the Army. Soon after, he was deeply devastated after the death of his assistant's dog, Whiskey. And that's, you know, the name Whiskey's Wish. We're going to talk, like I said, more about it. In an effort to support and assist in Scott's rehabilitation, close family and friends gave Scott the encouragement he needed, knowing that he was more than able to help and support others through his experiences, knowledge, and empathy. And like I said, this was the birth of Whiskey's Wish. Its important mission is to provide training and puppies for service dog training to veterans, first responders, and correctional officers who suffer from post-traumatic stress and other service-related injuries. And, I, you know, Scott and his staff down there and his wonderful wife have, they've done some amazing things. They have been touching lives ever since, basically, Scott got out of the service. And all I can say, he's an inspiration to millions of people around the world, and, and, and he's helping veterans and people that need the help, you know, one dog at a time. And I know he had to get up early. You know, he had to do this interview a little bit before time, and, just thanks, Jacko, for being here again, and I appreciate you getting up. I think it's like oh dark early down in Australia, so thank you. No, that's all right, mate. I, I don't mind getting up early for you. Appreciate that, brother. So, you know, let's let's you know talk about how you got to the Australian Army. You know, who your mentors were, what it was like growing up in Australia, and you know, we'll briefly hit upon that transition because I really want to talk today about Whiskey's Wish and all the great things you've done over this past year and the time before that. But what was it like growing up in Australia? Oh, no, it's, um, I grew up on a dairy farm in the middle of nowhere, so 10 miles out of a town that had probably 60 people in it and grew a, a pretty sheltered life, I suppose, because there was only um, – I didn't even know what a um, – a Western Oriental gentleman was because um, we didn't have any. It was all just <laughs> we were all just um, Anglo Saxons, and you know, like when an Italian guy moved in and started farming, it was like a big deal because I'd never met an Italian. So <laughs> it's just like it was a really sheltered life where actually we we're probably all inbred because everyone was my cousin. 
And it was probably good that I got out of that state and started breeding up, diversified our um, breeding pattern. <laughs> That's a good point. You know, I think uh, I was looking at our genealogy. They they were cousins were marrying cousins were marrying cousins. And it was in South Carolina. I think the same thing. Thank God my ancestors got out of there because I, I, you know, who knows yeah. what, what, what it would be like now. But, you know, did you have uh, military history in your family? Yeah, um, World War One, World War Two. There are a lot of um, my great uncles and great great uncles that served in well the Great War and the Second World War. Um, out of that, only one Jackman came home in the Second World War, and I was the second Jackman to come home from war. So I, I've got a pretty rich history in the in the first two world wars where um yeah a lot of um my ancestors i suppose um gave up their lives for our freedom and it was only um my dad would have served in vietnam but being the only son of a farmer they because obviously they want the the farming to continue dad was um i don't know whether he was in the lottery or not but um yeah he didn't get called up for vietnam I had a lot of uncles and that. I used to sit when they told their stories. I was really intrigued by that, and I was really happy. We went to the – you go to the town hall, and they've got a great big board up there, you know, with the with the, the pretty gold print on it with all the names, and there was a lot of Jackmans up on that wall, and I always used to look at that, that honour roll, and think, you know, like, how cool is that, like, you know – well, not cool that they died, but like that we had such a big um, sort of, um, well, what would you call it? Like we we were actually, like we were a big part of it. Like it's not like we held back or stayed home and hid. We we went out and, and unfortunately we lost a lot of Jackmans. We mustn't be very good fighters. <laughs> so um, <laughs> Or brave, you know, but, but, but brave fighters nonetheless. I mean, no, I um... – that's pretty interesting, man, to know that you have that that genealogy. Um, what was the decision for you to go in? Was it because of that? Or, you know, tell us about how you got to the to the Royal Regiment. Well, to start off with, I was in the, the, the reserves with First Armoured. I um, did 10 years as a reservist. Um, then got, so from 94 to 2004, then I got out. Then... I did a lot of other different jobs and when I was about 36 and joined full-time and I was a little bit older than everyone else, so I got called. It just um, it was something that I always wanted to do since I, like, I was really young, so all I ever wanted to be was an infantry soldier and had a lot of respect for those guys. So, yeah, I decided to become one. So what was that training like as compared to the armour training? Uh, the armor training was like it was a lot less punishing, I suppose, because you got to ride around. And then, um, yeah, because I, I ended up being an, an armored personnel carrier driver in um, first armored, so one AR. And then um, when we I went to the like the training for infantry was just out of control. Like I thought, I didn't think I was going to make it. Yeah, no, it was a, a real challenge. And then when you got to the end, you thought you were eating a bit and a packet of crisps. And then you find out that, you know, you get to your regiment and then you're just a, a nobody again. And then you work your way back up and then someone else goes overseas and you haven't been yet. So then you're shit again. So then you never and yeah, worked your way up. So it, like the training was really hard. Like, um, you know, I found it. But I, I loved it because, you know, like it was every – it was like I was getting paid to work out. So it was pretty cool. So I, I really enjoyed the training and I really enjoyed the camaraderie and, you know, like my, I've still got brothers and sisters um touch with. Um, unfortunately, last year I, I lost a couple of friends. They were on my trip to Afghan and both of them were only just 30 and both took their own lives. Uh Unfortunately, last year, one of our recipients of the program, a Vietnam vet, passed away and started the Dave Hanchard Memorial Scholarship Fund. <laughs> so, because he hasn't got any um, grandchildren that, um, like boys or grandsons, that can um, carry on his name through Whiskey's Wish. That's, that's outstanding. So, 
How did you get to, to East Timor? What happened there? And then, you know, tell us a little bit about Afghanistan. Well, East Timor 2010, it was um, the year before we still sort of started pulling out, like Australia started pulling out of Timor. And uh, it was just, well, it was a lot of kids with slingshots shooting you in the ass with stone. It was like, um, yeah, the little buggers, like <laughs> they'd run around and every opportunity you got, they'd be pinging, a, you'd be doing a bit of PT running around the compound and then you get hit ass with a stone and some little cheeky little four-year-old with a slingshot. So, yeah, that was pretty handy. But um, they were pretty subdued by the time we got there. There wasn't a lot of trouble. Um, I think there was only one riot when we were there. I was attached to the New Zealand Army. So you were with – so they is that an infantry unit too, the, the, the New Zealand Army? Yes. Oh, no, they were actually gunners. So they were a – Artillery. Artillery unit. Yeah. And – they were um they, they were the quick response force. So at that stage, I was a regimental signaller. So I'd been qualified as a um like as a signaller and a radio operator. So over there, I um was in charge of a like a um a signal attach uh, attachment. So I was attached to different groups and yeah. running the comms for like the New Zealanders and the Australians. So it was sort of a pretty easy gig. So that one was a good one. And then while I was over there, I knew that one of the majors was going to be raising Charlie Company when we got back. So I went and sucked up to him and said, oh, you know, you you're starting a new company and you might need some NCOs there. And he goes, oh, yeah, if you want it, you can. And I said, oh, that's pretty cool. So when I got back to Australia, I went from Signals Call to Charlie Company and trained up and got ready for our trip in 2012. We went over to Afghanistan in January. No, it wasn't January. Yeah, it was January. Yeah, January. Yeah, went over there, a little bit chilly. And we were there for the whole winter. And then I think our tour was just on six months because one of the other um, battalions hadn't had a trip for a while. So they stole three months off our trip and three months off the trip after theirs. Because they, they used to be, um, it was three RER, they, they used to be parachute um, regiment, but, but they lost their wings. And then they were grumpy, so they wanted the trip. So they got part of our trip. But Afghanistan was, um, that was an experience. Like before my first patrol, I, I was absolutely shitting myself. Like thought, I can't do this. But as soon as we stepped outside, like like it was just, yeah, job on. Like every all the training, I, every time you go out, you just think to yourself, oh, well, maybe I'm not coming back. So, you know. You just sort of accept it, like this one might be the one where it ain't come back, but I'm going to do my best to try and come back. So I'd say our, our section was instrumental in finding a couple of uh, IEDs. So what were the people like over there? Were they happy to see you? They had some really crazy traditions that really sort of, um, you know, like it was bizarre to me. <laughs> That's the thing, though, like I, they've got some – things that I just I just don't understand where the like how any normal civilization can think that that's a good thing like if you're gonna yeah that's pretty that's pretty heavy right there I um I, you know what were the bad guys like you yeah know, the, well what, what was the enemy like <laughs> well actually at the time it was good because the poppy season was really bad so they didn't get a really good crop from the year before and what happened was a lot of the um, – that was during, like, the last half of our trip. And anyway, the other end of Afghanistan to go pick poppies, and there weren't as many around. So what they did is they got the farmers, don't shoot at the Aussies, we're going to kill your family. So on patrol, like, I would say that we probably got shot at maybe two or three times, but it was from distance and it was like a farmer just – letting off a spray and then dropping his rifle and just running. So there wasn't a lot of like one-on-one -on -one combat. 
um, there's only one of our sections that was actually involved in a conflict, and that was actually with the Americans because they decided to put a big sound system on a Humpy and then drive through the valley <laughs> playing Born in the USA just to a bit to do the job. <laughs> These are the stories you don't ever hear about. You know, so, you know, it makes you, you know, what do they call that? Is that the fog of war or the craziness of war? What What is that? I don't know. I think it's the craziness of Americans. You guys are. <laughs> well, you know, we, we have been, we've been called, you know, we have been called many things over the years, I guess. But uh, that's the first time I heard of something like that. Yeah, they were drawn fire by, um, yeah, just <laughs> putting over the sound system and, um playing a little bit of Bruce Springsteen and getting them stirred up and then they'd shoot at them. Gosh, that's crazy, man. So, you know, tell us about your, you know, what happened in your injury, you know, and then, then which led to your ultimately getting out of the Australian army, but were you guys involved in some kind of skirmish? No, actually that's what's the most embarrassing part. We were on a night patrol so that when, in the morning when the Afghanis woke up, they would see a presence of soldiers that they didn't know were there, so that we just sort of were there in the morning when they woke up. Yeah, like we got halfway there and walking on that shaly rock, like I was going up a hill and properly, but I didn't say anything because I didn't want to be sent home. So I did the last six weeks of my uh, my tour over there with a with two bulge discs in my neck and one in my lower back, but I just kept going because I didn't want to be sent home. So I just hid my injuries until I got home. Then uh, when I got home, I was uh, ready to do a motion course. So I went to the, the doctors to get some painkillers for my neck. And then they ultimately found out that I had bulge discs and that I was to remain in the army. So they, Probably took them about 12 months, I think, to, oh, no, it would have been eight months, and then they discharged me, medically discharged me, and then I was just lost then. I didn't know what to do because, I, you know, the structure of the army and the job that I loved and all the people and just just the culture, like, um, yeah, it's, it's all gone then. You're not part of it anymore. That's um, why I'm very proud of my son that he's followed in my footsteps. I suppose I can lit live a little bit through him so but because he got injured when he did his uh like he was doing his infantry training he got injured had to have an operation it held him back eight months but he got through and he's now posted up here to brisbane so that's really good because now i've got my grandson and my son close by and you know i'm really proud of him i couldn't be any, any prouder of him well congratulations on that jacko tell so tell us a little bit about you know how you got whiskey and then how you started to form this idea for whiskey's wish well i got whiskey from another organization he was hind when i got him and that was the deal that i had to in the rest of the way we I got him probably, I would say, about six months after I discharged and I then had him and it, it made such an – like I'd never had a dog inside because I grew up on a farm like the dogs lived outside. And, you know, just having him there, like if I was having a bad time because I was drinking and smoking a lot of dope and too many oxies and just really – battering my body just so I could forget stuff that because there were a few things that happened overseas like I saw a lot of stuff that you know like didn't think it would affect me but I think with that combined with the injury and being taken out of the army like those things did bother me so that was a bit of a pain but so once I got whiskey he was really good he would follow me everywhere if I was sad he would you know come up and in the bed and and, you know, like if I fell over drunk, nobody could pick me up because he'd stand over me like a like a great big pit bull and just, um, <laughs> just tell everyone to leave me alone. Wouldn't even let my wife touch me to help me get up. So I'd have to lie drunk in the – and we had those little bindi prickle things, so like, little, um, like three, three-cornered prickles. 
and they grow and they, they you can puncture a tire with them and I fell over in them blind drunk and I had to lie there because nobody could pick me up because of the dog so he's very protective of me you know and, I um, I read an article one time where they say that dogs are like dogs and horses are like there's a genetic bond with humans because they've been around so long and once you bond with that dog of course it's your business now but that's what they become they become protectors yeah, no, and Whiskey was, he was a fierce protector, but he was really good. I could take him out in public and he was fine, but um, anyone came to the house and he didn't know him, and it was funny because if I had a friend over and I was talking, after 15 minutes, if I didn't pay attention to him, he'd go and bite the other person. So, <laughs> Did you train him to do Was he trained to do that? I don't know. He was actually, like, he was he was pegged in the program he was pegged not to not to pass and I just fell in love with him and I said nah he'll be right he'll, I'll be able to get that out of him and he was good in public it was just at home and like he did bite my son on the ass like the eldest one he's got a good scar there so yeah he's, he's bitten a few people he didn't bite me but um he was a blue healer and um I think because he had well we didn't know he had cancer at the time yeah but I'd, I'd say that that had a lot to do with his temperament. And so when I got back from, you know, you know I got back from Afghan, discharged, got the dog, had him for 12 months, decided to take a holiday to Canada. Um, we went over there for it, came home. And because I went to Costco in Canada, I thought, this is awesome. So I wanted to go to Costco in Australia because they just opened up a big store there. And I went in there and I was a little bit disappointed because everything in, like, I, I imagine it's the same in America as it is in Canada, everything's supersized. And we went to Costco here and everything was a bit smaller and I was a little bit disappointed that ours aren't as big as yours. <laughs> so but, uh, I haven't so been down in was- Australia, but I'm going to make it there. I told you it's on my bucket list, uh, Alice Springs. Yeah. We're going to get there, mate. I'm telling you. Well, that's good. You better get here one day. Don't know what the hell we're going to do there. You said there's not much to do. It's a lot of sand in the middle of nowhere, but I'm sure we can find something to do. I don't know. Well, you know, when all else fails, have a drink. But, yeah, like I say, I got whiskey. When I came back from um, Canada, we went to Costco, and I was just reaching down to give him a pat, and he had a lump near his collar. So I took him straight to the vet, and they said, oh, he's probably got a sore tooth, and we'll have to operate on that. So I said, oh, no worries, I'll bring him back Monday, took him back Monday, and, uh, yeah, he was diagnosed with terminal um, T-cell lymphoma. He lasted another three weeks, and I spoiled him rotten. I gave him, like, lollies or candy or whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. ice cream, the lot. Like, I spoiled him rotten for three weeks until he died, and he actually died on the day he was due to be put down, so he, he didn't actually get to be put down in a in a peaceful way. He died sort of, oh, it was pretty horrible to watch. Like, yeah, just coughing up a lot of fluid. And he and I just said, um, I'll come around in the morning before he gets put down. And I just said, kept saying to Whiskey, oh, you know, my mate's coming around. You're going to have to wait a little bit longer. And he waited until he got here, and then he gave him a pat, and then pretty much he died. Hmm. Sorry about that, man. That's, you know... You had that bond going with whiskey and well, you know, but the, 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 the good thing is it was a catalyst for what you're doing now. And, uh, well, that's why, um, with whiskey, because when he died, I was offered no support to deal with a recipient that's just lost their dog. So you've got a person that's got PTSD that may be suicidal. And then when you ask for help, there's none there. So. We decided from that point that we'll, because I wanted another dog, and unfortunately my dog's too aggressive for the program, so they call me the dogless leader. They don't call me the president. I'm the dogless leader <laughs> because I, I have got a dog, but she's just um, very aggressive. <laughs> well, she's only half the size, but yeah, she's a fiery little thing. So how long have you had? That's Gracie. Roxy. Roxy. Okay. So how long have you had her now? I've had Roxy for nearly five years. Awesome. So four years, I reckon. Yeah, and she's going all right. Well, so tell us about tell us about formation of Whiskey's Wish. And then, really, Jacko, you know, in your own words from personal experience, but also what you've been able to see, you know, with your organization, 
Tell us about the effect on the recipient of such a service dog, you know, about Whiskey's Wish Out for him. But tell us what what what's the real, real, real benefit of these dogs in people's lives? Well, they give them a reason. Well, honestly, it does. It gives them a reason to live. They've got a companion that doesn't judge them, doesn't tell them what to do, doesn't um, expect too much. You know, when they come up with the and they want to go for a walk or something like that, like you, you take them for a walk and they've all got their own personalities and you'll find that the, most of the people treat their dogs like like kids. Like they're just like, um, yeah, they, they do. And I do it too now. Like I said, I'd never be one of those people that hugs and kisses dogs. But, um, you know, the recipients, like they get their dog and um, we've had two cases where, people have had the dog and and actually got to a point where they didn't need the dog anymore like to go out in public like they totally sort of got over their um social anxiety and all that sort of stuff so they they've actually one of them had a dog for two years and now she's working she was agoraphobic so or agoraphobic if that makes more sense, I don't know. I don't know how Americans say. No, I just said it's perfect. Just either way, man. I think I get it. So, yeah. So, and she wouldn't leave the house, and now she's going over to. This is over a two year period, and she's going over to Japan and further in martial arts, and she's gone back to full time. And she was a she's a lovely lady, and she actually said, like, you know, poor her, her dog was named after a vacuum cleaner. It's called Dyson. I don't know if they have Dysons over there. Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. Old, and when she got to the point where she didn't need him anymore, she felt really bad because he he wasn't coming with her so much. So she actually gifted that to what, actually one of my friends, and now he's got a fully trained service dog, and he, he's 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 happy as anything. So like the best outcome is that they don't need the dog, which is a bit sad, I suppose, for the dog, but they don't need that um, extra support when they're out. But normally recipients, they get their dog and then they start and they need to, to build that bond. We used to supply the dogs or most of the dogs, but we found that when you give someone a dog that's not owned by them, it's quite easy to give back. So we learned a lot right at the start. Let me ask you this, Jacko. How, how long does it take to train a dog? Or is it different by the breed or is there like a set time that you all put them through that? Or No, it, it is different dog to dog. And you've got to remember some of these people take a little while to learn. Some people learn or can read it and do the same thing or have to have a, a one-on-one trainer. So you know, like it's it's different for everyone, but once they get that bond, it's um they're doing the training themselves. We're not giving them fully trained dogs. Our program's based on the fact that they bring their own dog into the program. As long as it's less than three years old, it's a, it's not a restricted breed and it's deemed um, suitable for the program. The way that we vet that is that we get them to take a video of that dog with children, um, with other dogs just so that we can see that they're not dog-reactive people or child-reactive and they're not going to latch out at anyone. So once we've established that they've got a good temperament, basics like walking to leash impulse so that they don't pick up food off the ground, so that they only take food from your hand, uh, they have to be able to um, – that's sort of like the basic stuff they need to know, like and name recall and all the basic stuff. Once they've passed that to a standard that I deem suitable, then I'll let them have the in-training jacket. And from there, they, because it could take someone, depending on the breed of their dog, because I'm not, not picking on Americans, but it, um, AM staffs are quite slow at learning, American staffies. Like it takes a little while for their brain to settle. So we've got those in the program but once they mature a bit like they're really good but then you could have a kelpie or a working breed dog like a blue healer and they'll they'll get to that point a lot sooner because they i'm not saying they, they seem to be a little bit smarter like the cattle dogs and and the sheep dogs like the working breeds seem to be a lot smarter than some of the other breeds but we do have some hunting dogs as well like some hungarian vishlers 
Um, we have a Great Dane in the program, so there's some restrictions on where that lady can take her dog, but she needs that dog to brace because she's got, like, physical injuries as well. Um, and now we just recently had a St. Bernard come into the program, so that'll be interesting. Yeah, that's a huge dog. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you this. How many dogs have has Whiskey's Wish uh, trained and sent through the program? At the moment, we've got 120 recipients and dogs in our program. Um, once they go through the program, and um, we've moved away from state-based accreditations because what happens is if you go into state, they don't recognise the qualification and you don't have the same rights. So we've decided to do what a few other groups have done and we've changed everything in the Federal Act, like the Disability Discriminant discrimination act of 1992 yeah subsection four <laughs> makes me sound smart when you're throwing a subsection. no no you got it man i love subsections you got yeah, it <laughs> and it, <laughs> yeah, it makes me sound smart or something you're a, you're a fairly large dog training center how many are there down in australia there is a 120 that we've got all probably like six in western australia 120 Wow. So, and uh, it's, all, it's pretty, it's got pretty big. So, um, we're actually lucky because we've got a few motorbike groups that are doing fundraisers and stuff for us. So, it's, um, that's pretty cool. So, your primary need is, is money. That's the primary. Yeah. yeah. And how can people, yeah. how can people donate to, to Whiskey's Wish? Oh, they can go to our website and, um, click on the PayPal button. And, and if any American, um people say that the button doesn't work they just have to send us a message and i'll make it work for them <laughs> so <laughs> button malfunction but, um, man yeah you know the currency conversion stuff yeah like it is the, at the moment it is money that we need we we got a small grant from the government to buy equipment it was one of those ones where everything has to be acquitted you know it's a very specific grant where they um it was um, $10,000 for equipment. So that equipment will probably last us a year and a half. So that's really good. That Because we've, apart from me being the head trainer and doing a lot of stuff online, what would you call it, like uh, guiding people over the phone even and or just making a video. We've got like a, a Facebook training page at the moment. What we, we plan to do is have a recipient-only website where they can put in their training logs, their um, up-to-date treatments because when we train these dogs, we don't just let them go after they've been qualified. We actually advocate for them. So they have to still send in um, training logs after they've been fully qualified and their treatments. So when they go into state or they go into a, a shopping centre where they're not being accepted but they've got all their shots up to date, um, and they've got all their training up to date, that when they ring us, we can advocate on their behalf because they're in front of us on a spreadsheet. So that's um, another part of it. And we've also got a padre in our program who's quite happy to speak to people. We have to help support them. And if they want another dog, help them, you know, choose the right one and make sure it's a good fit. And we have to look after these people. When we lost a recipient, like that was a, you know, I'd, I'd never even thought about that, that one of our guys might pop off the perch. He was a Vietnam vet. He was a, um, he's a, a, he's a lovely bloke and he was, um, his job in Vietnam was to carry water to the, the kitchens. You were talking about the recipient, but I wanted to ask you, what's the average cost, the average to train a dog? So if somebody's interested in saying they, they, they want to train two dogs or three dogs or they want to give you some funding what would what is what's the normal cost for a dog to train one by a fully trained dog that's 35 to 60 thousand we've asked i think we worked it out it's probably around about because we don't we have to calculate our time even though we volunteer we calculate our time and everything else and it is around about 35 that it would cost to train a dog so we have to put it in real time figures even though we're volunteering, so that we—that's like U.S. thirty-five thousand U.S. No, nah, no, nah, Australian. It's only half of that for you. So it's like that'd seven, be enough. 
Yeah, like, American dollars are good dollars. Yeah, send them over. I like American dollars. Yeah, they can go a little bit further. So, a couple questions. Let me ask you this: What do you want the non-civilian or the civilian world to know about combat veterans or people that are dealing with post-traumatic stress? What would you want them to know? I, I just think they need to to be aware of what PTSD is because obviously it's not just veterans, it's first responders like police, AMBOs, or what do you call them, Par- paramedics. Paramedics, um, yeah. yeah um, emergency services, not all of them go overseas, to, but they protect us here in the country. They go through the same sort of stuff like correctional officers get bashed, police get shot, bashed, paramedics get shot and bashed and stabbed. So, you know, like there's a lot of stuff that goes on at home as well, but they understand like the role of a combat soldier and and even non-combat soldiers But because some of them are just like the, you know, like the target, uh, you know, they do target acquisition and not right there on the ground. Yeah, I can hear you, dog, now. She, you know, she, <laughs> you know how dogs are. I got that little Jack Russell and she's out there. There's something underneath the walkway and she's barking at it. Probably a possum or something. You know how these Obvious. dogs are. Could be a snake too, but we don't have any poisonous ones, brown snakes like you talking about. But how can people help? Tell tell them that what they need to do if they want to send you some funding. Well, and uh, and how can we spread the message? If they, if they want to help, they can whiskeyswish.org.au and there's a PayPal button there and they can press on that and donate a couple of a couple of dimes and um yeah like what's your email address jacko can they email you too the email address is info at whiskey's wish so i-n-f-o w-h-i-s-k-e-y-s w-i-s-h dot org o-r-g so when I say org, I don't want you to get confused. O-R-G dot A-U. It's on our website. But, Perfect. Um, yeah. So, you know, let me ask you this question. What does freedom mean to you? Well, freedom to me is being able to, to go out about being uh, attacked. Because we've got a lot of um, displaced people from other countries. And, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of these um, African street gangs getting around. So, like, the freedom to me is being able to go out and do what you want without being, you know, just be able to to go about your business without worrying about someone else attacking you. I think that's what freedom is. Well, for me now, like, looking back at everything, like, that's what I think freedom would be, like, to have a country where you don't have to worry about. And that's what sort of upsets me with a lot of our... Um, I mean, it's slightly political. Uh, immigration, like, I I don't think they look after the immigrants better than they do our um, our old folk. So, like, our our retired persons are on a very small pension. Um, let's, let's just pick a, a – just say, for instance, an Afghan family came over. Um, not that I'm picking on them. But uh, to say that they were to come over and they – they get asylum and they get a pension and they don't have to do anything. They just have to sit at home and watch the the big screen television that our government bought for them. So that sort of, um, it, in a sense, like it, that's not really free. We, we're not looking after our old people. We're not looking after our sick properly. Um, I think we've got a better healthcare system than you've got in the States. Like we wouldn't, re- you, no one's ever refused help. Is that, you know, if they, they need it, they need it. There's no no um question of, you know, have you got insurance and then just pushing you out the back door where they cremate them. So, well, there's definitely, definitely some issues. You know, we have some immigration issues here going on at the, at the moment, too, you know, on our southern How's border. Yeah. You know, I, sometimes I wonder why we do the things we do. But, you know, do you have a um, <laughs> do you have do you have a quote, a personal quote? Of wisdom, oh, crap. from this is what and I don't. It could be anything you want. And this a quote about. I want Jacko's wisdom. Give us a quote about life. 
Hang on, I've got to try and think of a good quote. Uh, entirely you, mate. Just straight from you right. and your life experience. Give right. us a quote. We're yep. going to put this out there, man. <laughs> the dog got your tongue? Come on, man. Oh, no, it's just that we, you did this to me last time. It's too time early in the like, morning. I, get, I know, I get it. It is early in the morning, but like you did this to me last time, and I was like, my words of wisdom. Don't argue with a 16-year-old child because they know more than you do. <laughs> I love it, man. It's so true. Well, that's only because my son walked past and he's a, he's a smart ass. No, I get it. Hey, I know that age, man. But, you know, I, all I can say, you know, very privileged to have you here, Jacko. Uh, Scott Jackman, Australian Army, combat veteran, and a, a man with a team, his wife, great supporter, and his kids, and doing some incredible things to help people live their lives, you know, again through post-traumatic stress, and not just veterans, first responders and uh, correctional officers, you know, emergency management personnel, other people that have seen and been through traumatic experiences. And, and Whiskey's Wish is doing a lot to help people live better lives. If you uh, want to donate, you know, the information is there, whiskeyswish.org. My, my accent's not as heavy as his, .au. Uh, and they can definitely need the help. They definitely can use any dollars that, that anybody out there listening could send. But I just want to say thanks, Jacko, and, you know, blessings to your family. And uh, I have it on my bucket list. Hopefully I've got a few years left in me. Uh, but I definitely plan on making a trip down to Australia and uh, would love to link up with you guys down there and see what you're doing firsthand. And always remember... If you can't look on the bright side, I'll sit in the dark with you. See, that's a good one, too. See, I, I love both of those quotes, but that one hits home. Thank you for getting up early and uh, and for being here on Straight Outta Combat Radio. I look forward to our next conversation. And if you need anything, Jacko, you know how to reach us, man. Just reach out, brother. No worries. Well, I, I just want um, all your um, – your, uh, all your um, – People, I suppose, call you and, and listeners. listeners. There you go. The listeners, so yeah. Like, just like I'm yeah, trying to figure it your, out all myself. Your, uh, yeah, all your listeners to know that you know we we appreciate anything that we that we can get. Like all money goes back into the program. We're all volunteers. There's no um no one's paid, so it all goes to the veterans. The veterans pay, and pay nothing. It's a free service, and that's the least that we can do for these guys and girls that put their life on the line and have been injured mentally, physically. Oh, I don't think you can be injured any other way or internally. I don't know. Depends if they were there on man love Thursday, I suppose. But, yeah, no, <laughs> we need to look after all these people and, and, and they deserve to be looked after because the government won't do it, so someone has to. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and you know, and you have the word right, listeners. Thank you for listening to Strata Combat Radio. And, again, if you can help out, Look Whiskey's Wish up on the internet. They certainly can use the help. And thanks very much, Jacko, for being here. And I know I'll be seeing you again. Keep up the great work, man. No, uh, thanks, John. It's um, been a great privilege to talk to you again. You always get me in the morning. Well, you know, it's that, you know, we could do it. We could do it the reverse, but then you'd be up until midnight, man. You know, <laughs> how's that going to work? Oh, <laughs> oh no. But then I'd have to start doing lines of speed or something. That'd be no good. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be. God bless you, man. I'll talk to you soon, Jacko. Thank you. No worries. Love you, guys. You gotta light them up before they burn it down. Thank you for listening to another episode of Straight Outta Combat Radio, audio medicine from Green Zone Hero. If you liked what you heard, then tell others about us. Like us and download us. And please remember, freedom is not free. And combat veterans are vital assets. They're not broken. Save us all. Before they burn it down.